So what's a class NP is, and we're going to start with two informal definitions of it. The one that the book focuses mostly on is the second one. They kind of mention that the name NP comes for historical reasons and really focus on this definition and define this precisely, that this is the class of problems that we know that we can verify a solution. If we're given a witness, we can verify in polynomial time that it's correct. The place the name NP comes from, and I think a useful intuition for understanding what the class NP is, is non-deterministic Turing machine. So the N here does not stand for non. It stands for non-deterministic. So the class NP is the class of functions that can be computed in polynomial time using a non-deterministic Turing machine. And what we don't know is whether a non-deterministic Turing machine is more powerful than a standard one. Before getting to non-deterministic Turing machines, I want to review non-deterministic finite automata. Let's start with deterministic finite automata. They are machines where, at every step, you know exactly what to do. You have a rule, you look it up, there's no uncertainty, you do what that rule says. And there is only one choice at every step. That's what it means to be deterministic. For whatever state you're in, and that means the entire configuration, you know exactly what's going to happen next. So that's deterministic. What non-deterministic means is we can now have rules that give us options in the same state, on the same input, we can do two different things. In state two, if we saw a zero or a one, we go to state one. Now we can add a rule that says, well, we could also stay in state two. So we have two possible things to do on the exact same input, starting in the exact same configuration. That's what it means to be non-deterministic. Once we allow that, that means, well, one way to think about that is when we're executing, now we're in state two, we read a one. Now we could be in two possible states. We could be in state one, or we could stay in state two. And now the next input, let's say it's another one. Well, if we're in state one and we read a one, we stay in state one. If we're in state two and we read a one, we can do either of those two possible things. In this case, these are the same states, so we can merge those again. Those are indistinguishable once we've got there. Here's a non-deterministic finite automaton. How do you know that it's non-deterministic, other than that it says that on the top of the slide? Good. Yeah, it's got two different things you can do on node 1 on a 0. You can either stay in 1, or you can go to state 2. We have one accept state. We only accept in state 3. So what does this machine do? Should that accept? The intuition of what it means to execute is if your goal is to accept, every time you have a choice, you make the right choice. So if there's some way of making the choices when you have a choice what to do that leads you to an accept state, then you should accept. If there's no way to make the right choices, then you should reject. So any string that ends in 0, 1, we should accept. If our last two are 0, 1, the way we process with a finite state machine, we can't just jump to the last two. We don't know the end of the string until we get to it. Because of this non-determinism property, we can just stay in state one as long as we need to. If the last two bits in the input string are zero, one, we will accept. And because the non-determinism makes the right choices at every step, we don't have to do anything to think about that. We just know that it's going to follow that path and find the path that gets to the accept state. We can think of our execution model in two ways. So we can think of it as being all-powerful, that every time it has to face a choice, we can split into two machines, one that makes each choice. And we can keep all these machines that we need. Every time we make a choice, we have infinite power. We just make new machines that follow both choices. And if any of those machines that we create in our execution accept, we accept. If some of them blow up or get stuck or do something else, that's okay. If any one of our potentially infinitely many machines, it's not going to actually be infinite, accepts, we're done. The other way to think about it is the way I described first, is that every time we have to make a choice, we magically guess the right choice. Based on all the input that we haven't even seen yet, we magically somehow know how to make the right choice that's going to lead to the accept state, even though we haven't seen the rest of the input yet. Both of those sound like pretty amazing superpowers. Right? We certainly cannot build physical machines that do this. 
to do either of these things. For finite state machines, does this add power? One of those two ways, whichever one sounds more powerful to you. Does that make a finite state machine more powerful once we add that capability to it? How do we answer these kinds of questions? If we want to talk about whether one type of machine is more powerful than another, our definition of the power of a machine is the functions that it can compute. In order to say if type A is more powerful than type B, we've got to understand the set of functions that they can compute. If they're like this, they're disjoint. Maybe A can compute some things B can't compute, B can compute some things A can't compute. Neither one is more powerful. But most of the things we've looked at have been either like this, one is more powerful than the other. Functions that B can compute would be a strict subset of the functions that A can compute. If you were thinking about non-deterministic finite state machines and deterministic finite state machines, which would be A and which would be B? Which one is potentially seems like it's more powerful? Yeah, so the non-determinism is adding power. Every deterministic state machine can be interpreted as a non-deterministic one. It's just one that there's never any choices. So certainly the only thing we are doing is potentially adding power. We're not losing power. But it could be that they're the same. It could be that every function that we can compute with a non-deterministic finite state machine, there is some equivalent deterministic machine that can compute it. And if we're going to show this, well, we've got to show how we can construct that machine. Right? If we can show that we can always construct a deterministic machine for any non-deterministic finite state machine, that would show their equivalent. To show their equivalent, we would need two things. First, is there any function that the deterministic machine can do that the non-deterministic machine cannot do? No. There's not. We're only adding capability. That capability may help us or may not, but it definitely doesn't make it worse. And the proof is that every DFA can be simulated by an NFA because it is already. So this one is harder. Is there anything that we can do with an NFA that we can't do with a DFA? Certainly, we don't want to go through all the functions because there are infinitely many. So let's try to think of it as a construction. Remember what the F stands for. Right? The number of states is finite. So if we're simulating our omnipotent machine where every time we have a decision we can split, is there a way we can simulate that with a finite state machine? The regular finite state machine is in one of the three states. How many different configurations can the non-deterministic three-state machine be in? The number of states is finite. If we're simulating the non-deterministic machine, we are in some subset of those states. So we can create a machine where each state now represents a subset of the states in the original machine. And it's going to be deterministic and can compute the same function as the non-deterministic machine. All we've got to do is just keep track of the possible subset of states. So all we need to do is now create a bunch of states. For any finite state machine, we can do this. How many states are we going to have? In the worst case, how many states do we need to convert the non-deterministic machine to the deterministic? Yeah. Yeah, it's the power set. We need one state to represent every subset. Some of them may never be used. And pretty much right away, we know we're never in the empty set. Because if we're in the empty set, we have already failed. We're never going to accept that. We start in the state that is the subset of states, just state one. Right, that's the equivalent of this arrow. Now we see a zero. We go to the state that is composed of these two states. Where we go on a one is we stay here. In state one, two, when we see a zero, we're going to go, state two doesn't go anywhere on a zero, so we're going to go back to state one. In state one, two, if we see a one, we're going to go to state three and state one. What we do on zero and one is based on all the states that we could reach from that input starting from that set of states. So we can do this construction mechanically. Which are the accepting states in our purple deterministic machine? Good. Any state that includes an accepting state, which in this case, any state that includes three, so this is accepting, this is accepting, this is accepting, and this is accepting. We can mechanically convert any non-deterministic finite state machine into a deterministic one. So it is not more powerful. Every function that we can compute, we added this magic power of non-determinism, and it didn't even help us. 
Did it help us? Yeah. So it didn't help us as far as power. We can compute exactly the same set of functions we can compute before. It helped us in terms of what we can compute with a certain number of states. So if we had separate function classes for, and, and we certainly can define that, the set of function that you can compute with a non-deterministic finite state machine with three states is a bigger set than the set of functions you can compute with a deterministic machine with three states. Did it help us on time? How do we count time for a finite automaton? Pretty much every input symbol is one step. We don't go back on the input. The time it takes to execute is the same. Now, to actually simulate the execution with a real physical machine might be different. If you are doing network scanning with regular expressions, which are easily turned into non disturbing like finite automaton, if you want to do it really fast, uh, line speeds in your router, you want to convert those to deterministic machines that you can evaluate more quickly. But in terms of our theoretical model, it's one step for each symbol in the input. Okay. That was for finite state machines. Now we're asking the same question for Turing machines. Why was this easy for finite state machines to see that non-determinism didn't help? Okay, yeah, the total number of configurations is finite. Having non-determinism blows up the number of configurations because now it's the power set of the number of states instead of the number of states we started with. But it's still finite. What happens with Turing machines? Can we think of what it means to add non-determinism to a Turing machine? So the states of the Turing machine are still finite. The internal states we can keep track of now, that's going to scale to the power set of the number of states. But what else do we have to do every time we have a choice? Yeah. Every time we have a choice, if our notion of what it means for a non-determinist machine to execute is every time we have a choice, we try both. Well, the only way to do that with a Turing machine, the tape is part of the configuration. So we've got to copy the tape. Every time we have a choice, we've got to make two configurations that are full copies. So we're going to have to copy the tape. And every time we make a new choice, we've got a new tape. Oh, and how long is the tape? Infinitely long. The other thing is, well, we don't know how many steps it takes. So a finite state machine, we know it executes for the length of the input number of steps. How many steps can a Turing machine execute for? Yeah, well, they can run forever. That's why we have halts. So we don't have a bound on the number of steps. Each step, we can have two choices that double the number of machines. And each machine, potentially, we have to copy an infinite tape for. So this should start to give us a sense that that should be a lot of power that we have with non-determinism.